Copyright in these lectures is either owned by the ANU or a third party who has licensed the ANU to use it. Students may use the recording for personal study only. No lecture may be communicated online, copied or shared without the prior permission of the ANU. Okay, great, thanks. Um, uh, good evening or good afternoon, uh, everybody. My name is um, Paul Kenny. I'm a fellow and head of the Department of Political and Social Change. Um, and I'm also a board member of the South Asia Research Institute um, and uh, the Department of Political and Social Change. And sorry, have um, both uh, been able to bring out uh, Professor Stephen Pincus um, to give a talk uh, on his latest uh, research. Uh, so we're very happy that uh, you all could come and manage to find your way here um, despite the late change of venue. Um, Professor Pincus has recently joined uh, the University of Chicago, where he was a professor about 12 years ago before that, I'm, I'm guessing. Uh, in the interim, uh, he was professor of history at uh, Yale University. Um, I overlapped with Stephen when I was there. I was a graduate student in the Department of Political Science. Um, and even though we were in different departments, his influence was widely felt in political science, in economic history, political history. Uh, and sociology, just to name a few disciplines, and you'll see why his research is so uh, broad-ranging. Um, he's the author of uh, 1688, uh, a widely acclaimed book um, on the Glorious uh, Revolution, um, which looks at it not just from a historical perspective, but also a social scientific one. Um, and I highly recommend it. And uh, given Stephen's um, reputation and, and past record. I can only imagine how ambitious and uh, incredible this new uh, work is going to be. So I look forward to seeing a small part of it here. So please welcome Professor Minka. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, it's a, a, with a bit of trepidation I present this. This is really the uh, uh, virgin voyage of this uh, of this paper. Um, as you can see, it's something that I've co-authored. Um, uh, it's something I've co-authored with Alyssa Reichardt, who's a professor. Uh, she teaches indigenous history uh, in uh, at the University of Missouri in North America, and Tarana Baines, who's a South Asianist. Uh, and so the three of us together uh, 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 put this together. Um, so uh, I'm sure all of the problems with the talk were their fault, not mine, but because uh, uh, you can't yell at them. Um, uh, so let me start. Um, uh, so the British Empire in the 18th century was already global, and this map should give you some indication. Uh, not only was there an empire uh, in North America uh, and in, uh, in Bengal, but also uh, uh, briefly uh, there was already an empire uh, uh, in, uh, in the Philippines and, of course, substantially uh, in the West Indies as well. Um, and as you know, you are all too familiar, uh, 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 only four years after uh, the period which this talk is not only about, obviously there began to be an empire uh, here uh, uh, British Empire here as well. Unfortunately, from my perspective, the historiography of the empire has tended to not really be a historiography of the empire. It has been, in fact, um, a national or proto-national history. Most scholars tell the story of the empire in binary terms. Uh, that is to say, the relationship with the area in which they're interested in with Britain, with the metropole in one way or another. So we know about early American history. That is to say, the history of British North America before it would become the United States States or Canada, um, or the history of Jamaica, uh, even though, of course, Jamaica was part of uh, the British West Indies until uh, quite recently. Um, the history of the British Empire in India is frequently told in terms of a proto-national uh, uh, history of India, and of course, the history of Australia is also told uh, uh, on its own terms. My feeling, uh, and what I'm going to try to persuade you of, is that we should actually try to think the empire whole, and then we would see each part of the empire uh, rather differently. So I'm going to suggest that there are three advantages uh, for thinking the empire whole. First, uh, and I'm going to go over this rather, yeah, see that helps. Uh, 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 sorry about my, yes, see this is the maiden, maiden voyage and you see I get the colors all wrong and nobody can see anything, uh, which maybe for me is better. Um, uh, but but uh, in any case, uh, the advantage of thinking the empire whole are three. First, for imperial actors, um, because when imperial agents made decisions about deploying resources, whether for building roads or calling in naval support, they were constrained 
fiscally by what was going on elsewhere in the empire. So failure to take account of resource constraints or global perceptions of the nature of the empire necessarily provides a partial view. Um, in fact, uh, this is what makes a, a variety of, of, of colonial revolts seem much more heroic than they actually were uh, because one, uh, one doesn't take into account the fact um, that the British Empire had to make strategic calculations and decisions. Um, secondly, I think it helps uh, better to understand the colonists uh, or, or the settler perspective. So a fisherman in New England, a weaver in Bengal, a sugar planter in Jamaica, all responded to demands placed upon them in the context of what they understood to be a structurally linked global empire and the strategies of imperial actors. In other words, they understood what was going on to them in terms of what was going on elsewhere across uh, the empire. And it's in that context which one needs to assess their behavior. Finally, I think it's really important for getting indigenous history right. Um, so the historian of the Comanche Empire, Pekka Hamalainen, uh, a Finn writing about the Comanches and natural affinity, um, insisted um, that to understand colonial histories, it is often necessary to look deep into indigenous worlds and into the native-native relations that predated and coincided with the native colonial re relations. So that's his position, but it strikes me that the obverse is also the case. It is just as important for an understanding of indigenous histories to to look deep into imperial worlds. And what I want to try to recover then are the interactions, which is the key term for me, between the British Empire and most indigenous peoples. And that can be better understood if we understood the context in which the imperial actors interacted with indigenous people. So um, I, it strikes me that uh, recently uh, we've tended to talk about the British Empire as if it was a, a monolithic force and its reactions uh, in various ways uh, uh, to indigenous peoples. And it strikes me that one needs to understand conflicts within the empire to better understand the histories of indigenous peoples as well. And I'll elaborate on that a bit later on. So, the outline of the argument as a whole. You can see incredibly sophisticated argument. I've been thinking about this for a long time. I have lots to say. Um, um, okay, maybe not. Uh, so, first I want to suggest that there was a contemporary global vision, and I'll give you a few examples of that. Second, I'm going to suggest I uh, talk about what I mean by an empire. That is to say, I think we need to really define terms. Um, third, I want to emphasize that the British Empire was a state that developed strong institutions and infrastructure. And this goes against the sort of standard view, which I'll outline later on. Fourth, I'm going to suggest there were deep partisan divisions over how best to govern the empire. And those partisan, partisan divisions right across the empire uh, involving both col colonists and settlers, imperial actors, and indeed indigenous peoples turn fundamentally on different understandings or competing understandings of the political economy of empire. Um, uh, 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 fifth, I'm going to talk about an alternative global vision, settler colonialism, and why uh, uh, our method, I think, is superior for thinking about, uh, thinking about empires. And finally, uh, I'm going to sort of talk about the payoffs very briefly at the end and give you a few examples. Um, so uh, there was a global vision. So in the West Indies, in the 18th century, uh, there were newspapers like the Jamaica Current, uh, the Barbados Mercury. Uh, both of these newspapers uh, began being printed in the very early 18th century. And they provided an, an extreme, uh, an ex uh, a very rich account of, of, of imperial affairs to their readers throughout the West Indies. And just, I mean, I, I'm not going to provide you with the statistics, but almost a, 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 a content analysis of all of the colonial newspapers in the 18th century, and we took samples uh, from each and every part of the empire, indicates that about a third of the content of the newspapers printed in, in Calcutta, in Belfast, in Kingston, in Philadelphia, as well as in Edinburgh and London, a third of the content was about uh, about imperial affairs, that is to say, about affairs outside of the region in which the newspaper was printed. So if you were going to read the Barbados Mercury or the Jamaican Current in the 18th century, for example, you would learn of British ministerial attacks on freedom of speech in London and in New York in the 1720s. Uh, you would uh, 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 find concerns that the fall of the oppressive ministry of George Grenville in 1765 would not lead to political change because George III's uh, favorite, the Earl of Butte, was still 
guiding affairs. Um, and in the 1780s, um, you, uh, uh, West Indians were treated to great concerns about the advances of Hyder Ali and then Tipu Sultan and their French allies in India. So just because you were living in the West Indies didn't mean that all of the information that you had was local. It was, in fact, global. It was about the British Empire as a whole. And the same could be uh, said of British North America. And here I'll take an example from the most famous, uh, perhaps, of British North American newspapers, the Pennsylvania Gazette, uh, which was printed by uh, none other than Benj Benjamin Franklin. Um, uh, so in the summer of 1675 alone, and I just, uh, 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 in Pennsylvania, one could learn of, uh, 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 the Pennsylvania Gazette condemned the opposition to, uh, to the uh, uh, pro-commercial common law in Quebec. They learned of John Stewart's, the superintendent of Indian affairs, negotiations with the Creek in Georgia. They reported on tensions between Governor William Henry Littleton and the Jamaican Assembly. Uh, they detailed rumors of patriot attempts to topple George Grenville's ministry in London. Uh, they provided extensive information on the Spitalfield riots uh, and other forms of, of social unrest in, in England. Um, they provided local accounts of the white boy agitation in, uh, in Munster in Ireland. Um, and finally, they provided a triumphant narrative of the Battle of Buxar, uh, the defeat of the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II by Hector Monroe, leading to the granting of the Diwani. Again, this is just in the summer of 1765 uh, in the Pennsylvania Gazette. Uh, uh, Hickey's Bengal Gazette, published in Calcutta, uh, 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 also provided global imperial reporting. Of course, one shouldn't be surprised because James and Augustus Hickey uh, had, was an Irish patriot uh, who apprenticed to a Scottish printer in London before moving to Calcutta in the 1760s. Um, he provided detailed reporting of the struggle for control of the Caribbean during the American Revolutionary War. He, uh, uh, he again reported on the deep discontent in Jamaica about the actions of the imperial governor. Uh, and his readers were clearly meant to draw a parallel with, with the corrupt government uh, of Warren Hastings in Bengal. Um, and he claimed that Ireland is going to play the same game as America. And this, of course, he was right. He was writing in 1781, 1782, right before the Irish Revolution of, of 1782. Um, so the implications is that first, the inhabitants of the British provinces had a global, not a localist outlook. Now, the vast majority of, of scholars working on the empire assumed that everybody in, uh, in various provinces of the empire only had a localist outlook, but in fact, just the content analysis of the newspapers, indeed supplemented by readings of local diaries, indicate that this is, could not be farther from the truth. Second, when they referred to home, they didn't mean England. They didn't mean Britain narrowly conceived. Home was the empire. Information they sought was not just about from where the settlers came, which is what is always assumed in the literature, but also about the empire as a whole. And invariably in their diaries, uh, and, uh, 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 when, uh, when settlers uh, refer to home, they refer to the empire broadly conceived. Um, and there's reasons to believe, and again, uh, this is stuff that I can't go into in great detail, that Maroons in Jamaica, the Iroquois uh, in North America, and Bengali bureaucrats learned a great deal from imperial information networks about the struggles or what was going on at the empire as a whole. So I've been using the word empire a lot. The question, of course, is what is an empire? And what I want you to do, or what I'm pushing towards, is thinking beyond the structure that there's two models of thinking about empire. One is nostalgia, uh, looking back to the empire as a sort of great thing that, you know, if only we could return, restore the empire. Uh, uh, and the other is moral contempt, how awful the empire was. These are both interesting forms of analysis, uh, but neither of them, I think, are very analytically precise. And what I'd really like to do is to define what is, think very carefully about what is an empire. And it becomes easier to do this because in recent years, um, there's been uh, a, an explosion of quite sophisticated theoretical work about empires. Uh, this is uh, Empires in wor uh, World History by uh, Cooper Burbank and Tony Hopkins' American Empire, which has a long section on what is an empire, which was published just last year, uh, and Krishan Kumar's book uh, on empire, which was published this year. So there's sort of uh, uh, quite a lot of, of recent work. Um, why is there all this revival and uh, an interest in the empire? Um, uh, well, the answer to that uh, is, is fairly simple. There's broad, uh, broad 
uh, uh, spread widespread discontent with the concept of the nation state as the only possible uh, political future. So Krishan Kumar uh, has said, many people are no longer convinced the nation state is the best or only form with which to confront the future. Um, and uh, one can look merely at sub-state ter uh, terrorism, multinational corporations, NGOs, the European Union, all suggest other forms of political organization as a possibility. So what is an empire? I have a very simple definition. First, an empire is multi-ethnic, as opposed to a nation state, which is supposed to be, at least has a mythos of homogeneity. Empire is based on difference, different ethnicities, different religions, different cultures. As Charles Mayer uh, uh, of Harvard put it, uh, the empire is differentiated religiously, nationally, occupationally, and territorial. So, ter territorially. So first, uh, an empire is multi-ethnic. Second, Empires are a form of state. Um, uh, they have infrastructures and institutions which define them. Uh, as Karen Barkey, the sociologist, put it, empires at the height of their power were invariably strong states. Um, what that means is, given that definition, is that empires were neutral with, with respect to political form. Um, frequently th think about empires as autocratic, uh, etc. But empires are simply multi-ethnic states. Therefore, like any state, they can be repressive or inclusive. Therefore, like any state, they can be democratic or autocratic. Um, uh, the definition of empire doesn't tell you anything about the particular state form. Empires, therefore, have repertoires. Um, they have different strategies of rule, as Burbank and Cooper put it. Um, and Tony Hopkins, I think, had, in an extremely important essay uh, published now two decades ago, but elaborated on in this book, which came out last year, um, suggests that there's sort of two, form, two basic forms of empire, predatory and developmental. But unlike Tony Hopkins, who sees early empires as predatory and empires in the period that he works on uh, in the 19th and 20th century as possibly developmental, um, we see these two models already in conflict within the British Empire in the period before 1784. So in other words, we think that there are competing uh, visions of what the empire could be, predatory or developmental, and I'll talk a lot more about that uh, uh, in the time to come. So let me talk now briefly about the British imperial state. So the standard view is that the British imperial state was remarkably weak. And that's, uh, that view was uh, no better stated or summarized, uh, the consensus view, uh, than by uh, Neil Ferguson. You said the British Empire was the nearest thing there ever has there has ever been to a world government, yet its mode of operation was a triumph of minimalism. The British government was designed to privatize overseas expansion. In other words, no state, right? Uh, you can call this the sort of neoliberal theory. Um, but it's not just uh, Neil Ferguson who takes this point of view. Uh, Jeremy Black, who I'm extremely fond of since he just gushed over my last book in the American Historical Review, so clearly he must be brilliant. But on this, he's, he's clearly wrong. He says the limited authority and power of government within Britain greatly affected the character of British imperialism. This meant that the commercial focus, or at least nexus of much British imperial activity, was such that the role of the state was less than for Portuguese, Spanish, and French activity. Now, these are all very nice theories, um, which is why we tested them by doing a massive comparative fiscal analysis of imperial states in the 18th century. And guess what? The numbers show exactly the opposite was the case. The British imperial state was actually extremely strong. John Brewer, uh, long ago, uh, two decades ago, demonstrated the strength of the British state in Europe, the fiscal military state in Europe. Um, but in fact, our analysis shows that the British devo Britain devoted far more resources to colonial development than the French, Spanish, and Portuguese empires. And we can provide you with some numbers for this. <coughs> so the Spain, the Spanish Empire, Russia, and the Holy Roman Empire devoted over 90% of their revenue to war making alone. France and the Dutch Republic, about 80%, whereas Britain devoted only about 65% uh, of, its, of its revenue to war making. So what did it do with the other 35%? What did they spend the money on? Well, it turns out they spent the money almost exclusively in the empire, not in England. 
They spent it in development in the colonies in Scotland and in Ireland, at least until the 1760s. In the 1760s, they stopped spending money in, in Ireland at all, which has a lot to do with ex explaining what happened in later 18th century Ireland. There was very, very little direct spending in England. So to give you an example of how money was spent in England, um, uh, they went through traditional mechanisms. So the Turnpike Act, Turnpike Acts, which are quite famous, economic historians know everything about this in the 18th century, when Parliament passed the Turnpike Act, all they said was, we give you a right-of-way to build a road between, say, Reading and London. We don't give you any money to do it. You have to raise the money locally through traditional means. So they, the Parliament spent not a penny on building roads in England. In fact, they spent quite a lot of money in the empire on salaries of officials in the West Indies and settling immigrant communities in the various colonies, i.e. the Palatines, Germans in, uh, in New York. Um, they established the colonies of Georgia, Flor uh, East and West Florida, Nova Scotia, and Canada. Um, they developed infrastructure in New Jersey, although any of you who have visited New Jersey would be surprised that they spent any money on infrastructure in New Jersey. Uh, in New York and New England, <coughs> they rebuilt Charleston, South Carolina, when it burnt to the ground after the fire of 1740. Um, and actually, in an incredible national, uh, natural experiment, they provided hurricane relief in 1781. Now, as many of you probably know, hurricanes don't tend to follow national boundaries. Uh, they don't tend to sort of say, oh, well, it's going to stop here. And, and uh, 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 So in fact, there was a massive hurricane in the Caribbean in 1781 that devastated Cuba, that uh, devastated uh, uh, Saint-Domingue, uh, modern Haiti, and devastated Jamaica. In Cuba, the Spanish government did absolutely nothing. In Saint-Domingue, the French government said, you, have, you can have two years in, to pay the taxes. You don't have to pay the revenues immediately. In Jamaica, the British government sent 80,000 pounds uh, uh, to try to rebuild, uh, uh, to try to uh, rebuild the colony. So you can see the sort of very different attitudes uh, of the states. And of course, they also built uh, commercial roads in Scotland. And we know these are commercial roads because most of the roads, the military roads, went north-south. That is to say from England into Scotland. But in fact, in the 18th century, they met, uh, built lots of roads east-west to get goods to the coast to send uh, overseas. Uh, and here's uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and it, it, in, in North America, and this is sort of a, a bit of a case study, um, uh, uh, there was a complete transformation. So in the early 1750s, it took information from the American uh, interior about one or two months longer to reach London than it did uh, to reach Paris. By the late 1750s, the situation was more than reversed. It took uh, news reached, uh, reached London about five months before it reached, uh, reached Paris. Why this change? Because huge British state uh, uh, involvement in infrastructure. <coughs> um, as Alyssa Reichardt has said, has said uh, uh, in her doctoral dissertation, it transfer, transformed from a loosely connected, provincially oriented communications network to a robust, increasingly centralized British imperial communications infrastructure. What did they do? Um, well, they created uh, the New York to Falmouth pa packet boat run by the state. They created bateau services on North American rivers to trans uh, transfer uh, goods uh, and information. They established offices of the Ordnance, Quartermaster General, Royal Engineers, uh, and the Commissary. They professionalized the bureaucracy. All of these developments, of course, have been experimented on initially in Scotland in the wake of the 45 Rebellion. Um, and the communication shifted from private ad hoc mechanisms to professionalized state-sponsored ones. And all of this involves centralization. So before the Seven Years' War, uh, 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 before the Seven Years' War, communications moved from colonial capitals like Williamsburg, Charleston, Philadelphia. But during the war and after, it was all centralized based on this New York Albany axis, and communications spread out spoke-like from this hub across the North American continent. The implications for this were two. First, short term, Britain was therefore able to gain a decisive advantage over the French, who didn't spend on imperial infrastructure. Um, and this was true not only in North America, but was paralleled with, uh, with what happened in India at exactly the same time. So what was remarkable was that during the Seven Years' War, um, the British spent on infrastructure in India, allowing them uh, to defeat, or, uh, to defeat uh, the, French, uh, the French in India. Um, 
Um, and the French spent, uh, uh, so, so this led to a huge military advantage in the short term. In the medium term, it created a new web of roads, canals, and routes extending into the American interior which transformed, in many ways, the indigenous reality. So the new post-war infrastructure institutions, they first created Northern and Southern Superintendent of Indian Affairs in North America. Uh, and these are the two. Uh, uh, that's Sir William Johnson, who was a superintendent uh, of Northern Affairs. Uh, uh, and we don't have any images of John Stewart, so there's at least his house in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, rep represent, representing him. Um, uh, and all of and, and and there was a sort of fourfold strategy to limit Indian North South connections. They sought to monitor and could now monitor and prevent messages moving from the North to the South. They required passports and able to enforce them of all Indians and mandated the use of specific pathways, whereas before there was no controlling uh, indigenous peoples at all. They built roads to cut across Indian north-south paths, and they used treaties to extend to the western boundary so as to cut off Indian paths. Um, and what they did is they created an alliance in the north with the Haudenosaunee, or the Iroquois, uh, and, uh, and in the south with the Cherokee Confederacy. Uh, and here's Alyssa's very helpful map. Um, the white represents these roads built, uh, built uh, uh, by the British in the 1750s. And as you can see, they cut across all of the black and purple, the indigenous past, to really mean that it was the British who controlled all the communication networks uh, uh, in British North America. Um, so the British Empire, to summarize, the British Empire therefore depended on infrastructure. For comparative advantage against its imperial rivals, it transformed the experience of various indigenous uh, peoples in both North America and India, and it set the terms of negotiations. So many, uh, many scholars recently have been talking about negotiated empires as if you know, every negotiation is you know, uh, an equal bargain, but in fact, what determined who had the power in the negotiations was who had the institutional support and who had the infrastructure. And it was because of British expenditure on the infrastructure that it tipped their balance, tipped the balance in their favor in various negotiations, both with their imperial rivals and with various indigenous peoples. So now I want to talk about repertoires of empire. Um, there had been Tory versus Whig divisions for the second half of the 17th century. Uh, uh, the Tories had had a, a land-based vision, uh, uh, a land-based vision of empire, whereas the Whigs, relying on some of the political theories of John Locke, had had a labor-based th theories. But from the 1720s and 1730s, new divisions over the political economy of empire emerged. Uh, Sir, Sir Robert Walpole, the first British prime minister, uh, was associated with one particular vision of political economy. Um, and you can see uh, uh, Sir Robert Walpole was a rather large fellow, six foot, uh, six foot four, almost 400 pounds. Uh, uh, he was somebody who could you know, uh, exert his weight, quite literally, on affairs in a variety of ways. Um, he, his uh, political, uh, political economy of empire was that he emphasized that the value of the colonies lay in colonial production, in the labor of people in the colonies. His particular emphasis, the most valuable colony he thought were, uh, he and his uh, supporters thought were the Sugar Islands. Um, and of course, this meant that they depended on cattle slavery. Unfree labor was absolutely key to producing uh, the valuable uh, sugar goods. Uh, sh uh, and uh, he also argued that war was always bad for a trading nation. And there are two uh, extremely important political theorists of empire, um, most none of whom are taught, I'm afraid, in political theory courses, uh, which should be fixed. You should fix this. Uh, uh, one is uh, William Wood, whose survey of trade, William Wood, who was actually a Jamaican uh, and then moved uh, moved back to Britain uh, in the 18th century, uh, and Joshua G., who was a, a Quaker from Hampstead. Uh, and this is his house, which you can still visit in Hampstead, Fent uh, Fenton House. Um, so Wood argued sugar colonies were absolutely central because the colonies produced commodities indispensably necessary to this part of the world. They may, with industry and conduct, be made if we do not suffer the French to encroach upon us or rival us, an inexhaustible mine of treasure to their mother country. Jamaica, he said, was the most valuable plantation belonging to the crown. Slavery was the key. 
the labor of Negroes is the principal foundation of our riches from the plantation, said Wood. Um, uh, the Quaker G said our plantations are supported by the labor of slaves and our profit either more or less according to the numbers they are employed. Planting sugar and tobacco, the great causes of the increases of the riches of the kingdom could not be supported, said Joshua G. Uh, uh, unless you think Quakers were all anti-slavery, which seems to be the impression one gets from some people, uh, without African slaves. Now, the alternative political economy of empire was developed by the patriots, who were, uh, as I'll try to uh, uh, suggest to you, a, a political party, a trans-imperial political economy. And their political economy was, was, uh, uh, was developed in two newspapers, the Craftsman, which you probably all have heard of, and Common Sense, which probably nobody's heard of. Uh, 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 these two uh, newspapers began being published in the 1720s, and my survey suggests that these were the most widely distributed newspapers across the empire. They show up in the collections of, of people living in Madras, people living in, uh, uh, in Bombay, uh, people living throughout the West Indies, um, and indeed, uh, 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 a few weeks ago, I discovered it showed up in the collection uh, of, a Jewish, uh, uh, of a Jewish matron in New York City, also uh, in the 1730s. So these were very widely distributed. And their key principles were um, the key to wealth was not uh, colonial production, but colonial consumption. The key was exporting manufactured goods. Slaves were bad consumers and therefore inefficient, uh, uh, inefficient producers. And France was a th uh, posed a serious threat to British imperial prosperity. Raw materials, the Patriots said, were secondary. Natural commodities, however valuable, are never of any great service to a country because they maintain no great number of subjects nor enrich many individuals. Um, the gold and silver of the Spanish and Portuguese settlements um, uh, uh, of America are commodities of great value, but as they are produced by the labor of slaves and enrich only the king and a few lords, they have rather diminished uh, uh, than increased the power and the riches of both these kingdoms. The problem with mineral extraction and the cultivation of sugar, tobacco, or rice is that they maintain no great number of industrious subjects in which the power of a country can subsist. In other words, slave-based economies do not produce do not generate consumers which are necessary for economic growth. Um, so colonies were principally valuable for consumption, not for production. The principal benefits arriving to Great Britain for the trade of the colonies were colonial consumption of the woolen manufacturers and exported from Britain, their robust taste for British-produced linen and calicoes, and their burgeoning desire for luxury items such as silks, haberdashery, household furniture, and trinkets of all sorts. That's what Sir William Keith, who we'll meet again in a second, who was the Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania, argued. Um, so they, they uh, complained about the decline of trade, and they argued um, that slavery was deleterious. So Barnard said he wished none of the plantations found it necessary to have any slaves. Georgia, the colony of Georgia, founded in the 1730s, outlawed slaves, be slavery because it was against the gospel and fundamental law of England. William Byrd of Virginia hoped that the British Parliament would put an end to this unchristian traffic of making merchandise of our fellow creatures. But the arguments that were advanced against slavery were economic principles. Slaves were not consumers. Slavery created an oligarchical society, further hurting consumption, <coughs> and slavery required extent, uh, expensive militarization because slaves, unsurprisingly, had a tendency to revolt. So you had to raise, uh, spend huge amounts of money uh, building up local defenses against uh, slave rebellions. There were three regiments permanently stationed in Jamaica because of the basically permanent uh, uh, slave rebellions. So there was a partisan divide over empire. There was an establishment Whig model associated with Sir Robert Walpole, uh, which, was, which corresponds almost exactly to Hopkins's predatory model, um, and there were patriots who had a developmental model. And recent work in uh, Amy Watson's PhD dissertation has shown that these parties were institutionalized across the empire uh, based on her local studies in New York, Georgia, Jamaica, and Scotland. Um, and James Vaughan's book, which is about out in about two weeks, uh, shows that there were similar divisions in Bengal in the 18th century, that there were these, these political divisions cut right across the empire. So what were the implications for indigenous people? Well, let me just talk briefly about the walking purchase. Uh, 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 the, walking purchase walk, uh, the walking purchase is right here, established in 1737 in the, uh, uh, in the province of Pennsylvania. Uh, it was a sort of new accretion of land. 
Um, so what was the walking purchase? In 1735, proprietors of Pennsylvania produced a falsified deed from the 1680s in which the Lenny Lenape Indians supposedly agreed to sell a triangular tract of land marked by the distance a man could walk in a day and a half from the confluence of the Delaware and Lehigh Rivers. The Iroquois were brought in to force the Lenape to accede to the agreement in 1737. So the question, which doesn't seem to be asked, because it's always perceived natural, that if you have settlers, of course settlers will want to take land from Indians. But the question is, is why did the Pennsylvanians want the land? There was a shift in priorities from focus on trade with Indians, which was the Patriot policy in the 1730s of that Lieutenant Governor uh, William Keith, who I showed you before, towards one in supporting massive immigration and seizing more land. This was the establishment Whig policy. The goal was to make Pennsylvania a bread colony to serve the West Indian plantations, which the establishment Whigs saw it as the real source of wealth. So there was a, a massive immigration policy. Uh, uh, immigrants arrived, there was a massive immigrants arriving in Pennsylvania in the 20s and 30s um, who were normally seen as free agents, as you know, this kind of uh, Neil Ferguson's you know, privatized uh, movement. But in fact, they were anything but privatized movements. They were subsidized by the Board of Trade and came over in ships of contractors working with the Board of Trade. They were part of a struggle between the Patriots and the establishment Whigs who had conflicting indigenous policies. The Patriots wanted to trade with Indians. They imagined Indians as consumers of British manufactured goods, and they wanted to restrict seizure of Indian lands in North America. The establishment Whigs wanted to seize Indian lands to produce grain for the West Indies. They wanted an alliance with the Iroquois as a buffer between the British and French America. That is, they val valued the Indians exclusively as military allies rather than as consumers. Um, and this led to a colonial political struggle between Sir William Keith, the Patriot Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania, uh, who subsequently became the editor of the Patriot newspaper, The Citizen, um, and James Logan, the Colonial Secretary to William Penn, a Quaker, um, uh, who support, support, supported the, uh, uh, the establishment wave. So here's William Keith uh, in his house, Graham Park, uh, and, uh, which no longer exists, maybe tellingly, and James Logan's, uh, uh, James Logan, uh, uh, whose house, Stenton, still exists in Germantown, right near where my wife went to school in Pennsylvania, so we blame her for uh, Logan's policies. Um, uh, so the walking purchase, then, needs to be understood not as the inevitable result of immigrant pressure, but as the political victory of the establishment Whigs and James Logan over the Patriot policy and William Keith. So let me now talk a bit about settler colonialism. So those theorists of settler colonialism, and I talk about it with some trepidation here at ANU, because ANU was certainly uh, the heart of, of the development of settler colonial theory in many ways. Um, uh, 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 there are many similarities to our approach. Um, so those who talk about settler colonialism, like us, try to think transnationally and globally. So Johnny Farragher said it was a comparative, uh, that a comparative paradigm is the best insurance against parochialism and its ideological twin exceptionalism. So we like that, right? Settler colonialists think broadly comparatively and try to think about settlers across the globe. <coughs> Second, um, so, uh, those who write about settler colonialism don't think all history leads te teleologically to the triumph of the nation state. They try to think beyond nation state histories. They try to think, be able to write indigenous histories as not proto, you know, aborigines as proto-Australians or Maori as proto-New Zealanders, etc. But they try to think about them in, a, in, in, in other terms. Um, uh, so the, what is a settler colonial approach? Well, I probably don't need to repeat this to anybody here, but I will briefly. It focuses on a double dynamic, uh, a dynamic between the settlers and indigenous people on the one hand, and secondly, the dynamic between the settlers and the imperial overlords on another. The goal of settlers uh, uh, is, was to replace, or is constantly to replace indigenous people and take their land. So Patrick, uh, Patrick Wolf, in a, a doctoral, well, uh, in work that began here as a PhD student, argued that settler colonization is a winner-take-all project whose dominant feature is not exploitation, but replacement. Settlers seek to replace indigenous peoples, uh, not necessarily to exploit them. Uh, so this is very interesting, settler colonialism, but we think our approach to thinking the empire whole is better for four reasons. First, settler colonialism as a model excludes India. Uh, 
Uh, there was no substantial settler population as distinct from state or company bureaucrats uh, in South Asia. And by, by excluding India, it strikes into the settler colonial model reproduces Sir John Seeley's politicized distinction between true colonies where settlers came in India. And therefore, this uh, doesn't uh, pre prevent thinking about the empire whole. And this point was recently made and, uh, and argued uh, from a very political point of view in a book published by Amanda Beam, uh, Beam by uh, Routledge this year. Second, settler colonialism minimizes the role of the imperial state. When it comes to the state, colonialism and settler colonialism operate differently. The state is paramount in the former and is minimal in the latter. So for people who think about settler colonialism think the state is largely absent. Well, uh, that was what uh, Lorenzo Veracini said. Uh, Lisa Ford, uh, 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 who teaches at Sydney, said, while settler colonies often assert sovereign claims on behalf of the empire, the real content of their claims, however, was local territorial control over the process of indigenous dispossession. What matters is what happens exclusively on the locality. The imperial state is irrelevant. Um, uh, what distinguished 20th century local coloni uh, settler colonialism for earlier instantiation was precisely that settlers in these later cases, only in the 20th century, remained politically and in the last instance militarily subjected to and dependent on the metropole. So earlier settler colonialism had no such ties to the imperial state, according to Carolyn Elkins and Susan Peterson. So the settler colonialism paradigm therefore reproduces the neoliberal position that Neil Ferguson, ha Neil, uh, Ferguson has of the imperial state. And we actually think, for better or for worse, most frequently for worse, the imperial state really matters. Third, settler colonialism has a too constricted view of political economy. The primary ob object of settler colonization is the land itself, rather than the surplus value of to to be derived from mixing labor with it, said Patrick Wolfe. Um, and this statement is repeated over and over and over again in the settler colonial literature. It suggested that land is the only basis of wealth. Whereas what we're suggesting, in fact, is that the repertoires, the big fight over the nature of the empire, were competing notions of political economy. Those who thought, who focused on colonial production versus those who focused on the dynamic interplay between colonial production and colonial consumption. So we think uh, uh, settler colonialism reads out that part of the story. Fourth, settler colonialism homogenizes attitudes of both empire and indigenous peoples. The approach strips out politics from both indigenous people and the empire. So Farragher, uh, in his critique, points to peaceful relations between New Sweden uh, and the Lenny Lenapes and peaceful relations between French Acadians uh, and the Mi'kmaqs. Um, our approach, I think, is to uh, broadly to eliminate homogenization. So just as the path-breaking Australian histori uh, historian Henry Reynolds has insisted that there was um, no single mode of black behavior, that there was always diversity, contradiction, competing objectives, that Aborigines behave politically even in the most unpromising and challenging circumstances. So by contrast, we need to pay attention to the tensions, contradictions, and politics of imperial actors as well. So what? Why have you been wasting your uh, Monday evening listening to me Twitter on? Um, let me give you two examples. Um, the Boston Tea Party of December 1773, a story that you know, every uh, American school child used to know uh, was what led ineluctably to the American Revolution. These you know, uh, gents in Boston Harbor throwing uh, British imperial tea into the harbor uh, when it was going to be taxed by the Tea Act. Um, so the standard story is when they learned of the East India Company's plan to send cheap duty tea to America, many colonists suspected a conspiracy between the British Ministry and Company directors to trick them into recognizing Parliament's claim to the right of taxation in the American colonies. That it was all about, you know, what was going on in North America. It was a local affair which led to a local reaction. In fact. The colonials knew everything about what the East India Company had been doing in India. So Ezra Stiles, a minister in Newport, Rhode Island, wrote in his, uh, wrote in his notes in 1776 that when the East India Company contest themselves with the commerce they might endure in India. But grasping at power and internal dominion in India will prove the ruin of the company and the commerce at a time when perhaps providence may make it for the best uh, for both 
uh, for Great Britain and America that both should cease. By 1773, Americans were familiar, we are told, from the London prints of the East India Company's acts of unheard of inhumanity. In fact, the two most important American publications emphasize not you know, what local affairs in North America, but what the East India Company had done in India were warning that finance in the East India Company would lead to the same actions in North America. And these are the alarm in John Dickinson's uh, letter. So <coughs> John Dickinson said, the East India Company's conduct in Asia for some years past has given ample proof how little they regard the laws of nations, the rights, liberties, or lives of men. They have levied war, excited rebellions, the throne lawful princes, and sacrificed millions for the sake of gain. The revenues of mighty kingdoms have centered in their coffers. And these not being sufficient to glut their avarice, they have, by the most unparalleled barbarities, extortions, and monopolies, stripped the miserable inhabitants of their properties and reduced whole provinces to indigence and ruin. Fifteen hundred thousands. In other words, close above, uh, well, in fact, recent estimates suggest maybe between two and three million people perished by famine in one year in the Bengal famine because of the activities of the East India Company. So the reason why the North Americans were upset about the importation of tea was because they were upset to be supporting the East India Company, which they saw as a tyrannical group. They killed three million people in South Asia already. And what was the population of British North America in 1773? Three million people. That was the reason why they were upset, and this was the same argument that was made in the alarm. Um, um, in, in Bengal, by contrast, they also drew parallels with North America. So North's 1773 Regulating Act created a governor general centralizing control of presidencies with Calcutta at the head. It was modeled exactly on what had just happened in North America, where Thomas Gage became governor general of all of North America. In 1784, Pitt's India Act gave greater ministerial control by creating the Board of Control. In 1786, Charles Cornwallis, the man who was defeated at Yorktown, became governor general of, the, governor general of India. And in 1793, he passed the Cornwallis Code, excluding Indians and Eurasians from the civil service. The reason why he did this, it wasn't just because he was a racist. It was because he, he had learned, he wrote in letter after letter after letter, that allowing Creoles to govern the assemblies in North America had led to the revolution. So he was going to be damned if he was going to allow Creoles in India be part of the civil service. Um, so uh, uh, the reforms were all discussed in an imperial fr uh, frame. The goal was to avoid the mistakes of America. By the wise administration of our affairs in the East, we may counterbalance in some degree the unhappy dismemberment of the British Empire in the West, said one pamphleteer. <coughs> um, uh, uh, opponents similarly said that uh, Pitt's India Act of 1784 was reenacting the mistakes of America. Look at America, or if they can't see so far, look at Ireland, which had just had a revolution of its own. So let me conclude by giving you three reasons to think the empire whole. First, the British Empire is a structural phenomenon. Imperial structures explain patterns of development, military victories and defeats, and the growth of chattel slavery. You need to study the administrative and fiscal history of the empire to actually understand what was going on. And unfortunately, with the cultural turn, we've ignored the administrative and fiscal history of empire. Second, the British Empire was administered globally. Repertoires of empire were debated on a global scale. Experiences of one place were applied to others. You can't study one colony or proto-nation in isolation. You need, therefore, to study the intellectual and political history of the empire, not locally, but on a global scale, because that was the way people in the 18th century thought. Third, the British Empire was experienced globally. Intentionally or unintentionally, the structures and actions of the British Empire, shaped by a hotly contested imperial politics, interacted with indigenous polities and peoples. Taking the imperial out of the equation in favor of just looking at settlers, which has been the trend for the last half a century, misses a great deal. You need to study indigenous settler and imperial history to capture the interactions. You can't just study one uh, one of the three elements. So that's all I have to say. It's sort of a methodological call for a new way of thinking about the British Empire. Thanks very much. Sure.
other aspect you talked about was, was sort of associated with learning better coercive tools that you might use in building this empire of state when you when you were trying it. I mean, think of a kind of uh, you know a role also which I heard you talk about too about creating amongst the settler population some kind of unified understanding of empire and, and uh, as a special <coughs> political entity that one might belong to. Um, there's obviously the trade-related industri industrial policy piece here as well. And then the fourth as well, which, which you know, might be just about kind of bureaucratic prerogative, that is that particular ministries sitting within the UK or within Britain, um, you know, had a, uh, a, a mission that was associated with spending infrastructure. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about about that, what what do you think drove, or your research has shown, drove um, that that particular information we have? Right. <coughs> <coughs> the increasingly, I mean, uh, I think the economic argument becomes increasingly important. Um, so the claim is increasingly made that um, one of the advantages of empire um, is size. Um, and uh, the arguments made over and over and over again that you get huge amounts of inefficiencies if you if you think in terms of a locality, um, and uh, uh, and you try you know you need to become uh, try to become as self sufficient as you can in terms of grain production, right? Um, that means that you're shifting land. You know you're having to do all sorts of things to the land in a variety of ways. You know a supplement it in a variety of ways when maybe it might not be the most efficient thing to be doing uh, doing with the land. Um, but obviously you don't want to be dependent in more time on imported grain from your enemies. Um, uh, and so one of the arguments that they make is that is that um, we need information uh, about uh, what what are the easiest things, the best things to sort of produce. Uh, in, in a particular area, and remarkably, from the 1680s onwards, um, the the uh, the British government, uh, uh, initially the the Lords of Plantations, but then the Board of Trade, from 1696 onwards, every two years they send out a, they send out these surveys to every single colony, every single province, asking about a survey of what's being produced. Um, what are the local manufacturers? What what are they doing well? What are the comparative prices of what they're able to produce versus others? Um, they're trying to get, gather this information uh, as best as possible. Um, increasingly, over the course of the 18th century, there's an argument that this information so that that this information is being hoarded or guided by the Ministry for Political Ends. So, for example, if you had a political economy which uh, favored colonial production. Uh, you would say uh, you would talk about uh, talk uh, focus only on um, sugar, rice, or whatever is being produced, uh, and not talk about about local consumption or vice versa. And the argument uh, uh, increasingly in Parliament um, is, and you'll see this over and over again, um, not just in the Imperial Parliament but also in the local assemblies, is we don't have good information to make good economic decisions. Now, of course, in many ways, you could read Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations as, as the sort of epitome of this sort of complaint. Uh, I mean, his argument, and it's an argument which is developed, is that the Navigation Acts actually lead not only to bad flows of, 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 of commercial flows, but also bad flows uh, of information. So that's, that's an argument which I think is, is extremely important. Now, it's also true, of course, that there, there is, you know, throughout the period, I mean, the, the concerns of defense are, are always there. So they're always trying to seek as much information as they can about what the French are doing, what the Spanish are doing, um, uh, what various indigenous groups, et cetera, are doing and trying to sort of deploy resources in the best sort of way. Um, but a lot of that information, what they really want to know is not what's happening on within the empire, but what's happening on the borders of the empire. Um, uh, so it's a different kind uh, kind uh, of, of information. They also, I mean, when, when I talk about communications, I don't just mean flows of information. Communications also, uh, uh, in the 18th century sense of the word, which is the way I'm using it, also means simply building roads. So they're also talking about just connecting things uh, uh, in a variety of ways. But, uh, but I, I mean, uh, um, I do think um, uh, what, what's remarkable for, to me uh, I mean, this is this is an interesting. I mean, this is a, a fact that most British historians won't tell you. Um, eighty percent of of the number, eighty percent of the days. This is an analysis again. Eighty percent. It's uh, over the course of the 18th century. Eighty percent of the days in which Parliament debated anything, they debated imperial affairs, and what they debated. I mean, so so you know. I mean, most British historians write about what's going on. You know. With, 
in, in the British Isles, since that's you know, the only thing that's paramount. But that's not what people in the 18th century cared about. And when they talked about imperial affairs, it was mostly talking about various uh, commercial issues. So I do see, think the sort of political economy is really central. Well, I was very interested in the statistic you had that, you know, say, Russia and Austria Hungary devoted 90% of their uh, expenditures to war, and the British devoted them much less. And I mean, there's a couple of possible explanations to that. One of which is the British economy was just more efficient, more mercantile. The other one of which is that in a place like Russia, I mean, war is the purpose of the state and it's the pleasure of people who run the state. So, you know, naturally you would do the thing you enjoy the most. Whereas in a more mercantile, uh, Britain, there was, you know, probably going back to the Civil War, there's a rejection of that, that aristocratic approach to life. Oh, without question. I mean, I, I mean, my, my view is that 1688 is the, is the is the point where it becomes really a commercial society. But I think you're absolutely right. I mean, for my, to my to my mind, um, uh, uh, I mean, this is the problem that I have a bit with the sort of the the, uh, the bellicist approach to state formation, which says you know every state is always trying. To, the key thing is competition for war. And I think you're right um, to say that some states, like Russia, uh, prioritize. W- War more than other states. Uh, I think that's that's absolutely right. And the question is why. And I think it's absolutely because um, uh, in in Britain uh, the commercial classes had a much larger role in the polity. Why did they have a much larger role in the polity? Well, the fa- the fact of the matter is is that arable land in England is tiny compared to Russia or compared to France. So if they're going to compete with these much bigger places, they needed to draw on their one advantage, which was commerce, and that was basically what was decided uh, uh, decided in 1688. So I think, um, and I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think what what you say is absolutely right. The question is, okay, once you've devi- decided that commerce is what you're going to do, what kind of commerce? How do you how do you best maximize that? And that's where I think these debates over how to organize the empire are central about whether it's about whether the whole idea is to have colonies producing things, you know, valuable goods, sugar, uh, 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 rice, tobacco or whether the idea uh, is to focus on colonial consumption. The argument for colonial consumption, I I mean, one of the things that I didn't say, because I didn't, you know, uh, is in an 18th, 17th and 18th century world where everybody has extremely high tariff barriers, I mean, uh, uh, you know, they're perhaps, you know, Trump's model of the way to organize an economy, right? Um, uh, very high tariff barriers. Having colonies is great because you don't have tariff barriers with your colonies, right? So, um, so in the period, I mean, the the period that I'm talking about is largely the period when British industry is taking off. Now, in fact, there are good reasons to think that French industry was taking off the same for, at the same time. Why did the British gain the advantage? Because they have d- dynamic colonial consumers and the French don't. Right? The population of French, uh, of French America is tiny compared to British in America. <laughs> and the population of, <coughs> throughout the British Empire, the population on average in their colonies in the 18th and early 19th centuries, this is before the population explosion that Jamie Bellich has written about, um, is doubling every 20 years. The population in Spanish America, pretty flat, right? Population of French America is going down. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so, so you have this this dynamic consumer base, and so it makes for a good argument that uh, that this gives you, you know, if you're manufacturing goods, you've got these great markets, right? A dynamic market, and a, and and all of these places, all these colonial markets, are places where land is comparatively cheap and labor is comparatively expensive, right? So these people have expendable income to buy imported goods. Um, so that was that was the kind of patriot argument about why consumption mattered. Um, uh, uh, the establishment Whig argument was a much more traditional argument. You know, the value of colonies is to produce stuff, right? I mean, the Spanish Empire, what did it produce? It produced silver, right? Uh, and, 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 and huge sorts, uh, and huge sorts of way. Uh, so, so um, it was a different model of how to run an empire. But it was, but both both sides thought, thought it was a commercial empire. There's no question about that. Yeah, Paul. So I just want to ask you a little bit more about this um, establishment Greek patriot division, sort of I'm thinking, yeah. taking up the kind of Tory and Whig uh, debate in the 1680s, 1690s, which was essentially resolved in favor of the Whigs, right? Yeah. And then it sort of seems to reemerge in this re establishment yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, patriot division. And I'm, I'm curious, so, so you describe it in terms of a conflict of ideas of political economy. 
But I'm wondering, can that one be tied to their interests? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Investors in colonial companies versus manufacturers in Britain. Absolutely. No, 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 no. I mean, no question. I mean, this was, I mean, I tied it into, I, I mean, you know, it's a nice shorthand kind of idea, but absolutely. I mean, my whole notion is that these are really profound social divisions. Um, now, you know, on the margins, the ideas do inform interest. So, I mean, one can show patriot landowners tended to be very interested in turning their land, land manufacturing stuff on their land, uh, whereas establishment Whig landowners tended to uh, uh, tended to want to invest overseas. I mean, they tended to invest in sugar plantations, for example. Um, um, so, you know, which came first is not always clear, but, but on the whole, on average, there's no question that it's manufacturers who support uh, manufacturers on both sides. Now, I mean, we tend to think about, you know, the important class divisions of the 19th century, that is to say, uh, 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 people who were, you know, manufacturers in conflict with their laborers. But it, t it turns out that in the 18th century, voting patterns, and this, you know, we've done a lot of work on this, suggest that they tended to be mostly aligned against uh, uh, people who, are, who focus much more on on agriculture. That is to say that manufacturers and their employers, their laborers, tend to be alike. Now, of course, it's not a perfect measure because obviously the laborers who could vote tended to be the wealthier laborers, right? I mean, that, that those who those who were really at the bottom of the totem pole couldn't vote. But at least that those divisions which would emerge later on, that is to say in the 1780s, 1790s, uh, 1800s, hadn't yet emerged, so they tended to be a cohesive uh, voting block of manufacturers. Um, and they tended to be, I mean, they tended to be very close alliance, um, uh, by the way, uh, between manufacturers uh, uh, in Britain um, and, uh, uh, and landowners in North America uh, because they wanted to consume manufactured goods at the lowest possible prices. So George, George Washington, for example, a relatively important figure in our history, in American history, uh, right, I mean, his closest friends in London, uh, uh, in, in London, were merchants who sold manufactured goods, and he was in constant correspondence with manufacturers in places like Manchester and Sheffield. And those were people he thought of as his closest allies. So have you coded that? What? You coded sort of parliamentary backgrounds? Or yes, or yes, or yes, cool. yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. I've got two comments, one historiographical and one analytical. And my general reading of the literature on the early British Empire in Asia it doesn't really fit with your suggestion that it's blind to what's going on in the rest of the world. I think the, the people who are writing, the scholars who are writing about this, uh, this empire, are constantly aware of what's going on in America, constantly aware of what's going on in So, uh, in who, who are, in, in are you thinking about in, Peter Marshall or... General, who, who are you thinking of? That's a very good question, because it's, uh, it's just my general impression yeah. of, the, of the scholarship. Uh, but I wondered, particularly because your presentation was very much focused on the U.S., whether you're actually doing a service to U.S. historiography, which is tended to be very appropriate, Rather than to the yeah. Of the no, I mean, so, 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 I mean, I, I could have, I mean, I probably should have, but I, I, I mean, my own view is that the same is true of South Asian historiography, and increasingly so. So, the exception, the honorable exception, to in many ways, is, is, I mean, there are two, right? I mean, uh, various ways. I mean, Chris Bailey and, and Peter Marshall, uh, uh, and to some degree, Guha's earlier work. Um, uh, and obviously, I mean, one can think of, I mean, Nehru's, I mean, Nehru's own vision was one which was very deeply informed, but that seems to me of what, I mean, you know, the division between bad England and good England, uh, which was really quite alive to this, but that seems to have fallen out of the historiography. Um, uh, so, but the problem with, so Marshall's story, and I'll just talk about this because, you know, his stuff I just uh, looked at. I mean, so Marshall does, I mean, his recent work, The Unmaking and Making, uh, The Unmaking making and Unmaking of the uh, British Empire, he does think globally, um, but it's globally only in terms of the absolute absolute elites. There are no ideas in his story. His story is one where there's no political conflict in Britain itself, right? Um, it's the conflict between administrators. Um, there are no ideas and there's no social content to it. Um, uh, uh, and, and Bailey's story, um, uh, you know, most, I mean, most cleverly done, I mean, I think in, in Imperial Meridian, I mean, that's one he really thinks most, most globally. It's a story about an almost Foucauldian shift in the 1790s. Right? And part of what I'm saying is the stuff that, that Bailey's talking about happening in the late, very late 18th century and the beginning 
of, of the 19th century is something that's, um, that's going on earlier uh, in the 17th and 18th century. So in some ways, my crit critique of Bailey is very similar. So Bailey's story is, right, the making of the modern world doesn't begin until the 1790s. There is no global vision before the 1790s. So that's one of the things that he sees as this real shift in this period. And I'm arguing that that's, you can say that if you don't read anything before the 1790s. So my, my point is is that my point is is that yes, in the 19th century, the historiography on South Asia is global, or some of it is, the best of it is. Um, but the 18th century historiography uh, is not, and I think that, that 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 really does an injustice to the struggle. I mean, I think the struggles between Lawrence Sullivan, I mean, this is stuff that I've done a lot of work on. The struggles between Lawrence Sullivan uh, and Robert Clive are not only things that are going on uh, uh, going on. Uh, in, in India House, uh, you know, on Leadenhall Street. There are also struggles that, in fact, if one works uh, 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 in, in, East, in, in the company archives, and I know why people haven't done this, is because of the failure, cataloging failure. So if you, catalog, if you look at the cataloging of the material, you can see the, the correspondence between, uh, uh, between the factories, not just in India, but throughout the East, and the East India Company are cataloged until 1718. The period between 1718 and the end of Cornwallis's governor generalship are not cataloged properly, right? So you can only read about the local factories, which is why that historiography focuses exclusively on what's going on in South Asia, not on the sort of global vision, where you see the global vision in the correspondence back and forth. And I started working through this very fairly systematically, and it's there. They're really thinking there's this conflict between Sullivan, who's very much aligned with the Patriots, and his guys, and he has lots of guys in the company, and the people who Klein are put, putting in power, um, uh, uh, who are have very much this kind of extractive, predatory model of empire. And this is the real struggle going on within the company, and you see this in the correspondence going back and forth. But my own view is that the South Asian historiography only allows for the global possible vision from the very end of the 18th century. And I think that's what, I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of the late Chris Bailey's work, but I think he starts the story of this this dialectic far too late. Okay, uh, thank you for that, uh, Just very slightly the same perspective. You were talking about South Asia perspective of the global uh, 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 imperialism, but could you just extend your view on the Southeast Asia and East Asia? How much that much uh, uh, British influence? Uh, Right. So in, in this period, right, I mean, so this is right, I mean, the, the, I mean, the McCartney mission, you know, doesn't happen until the 1790s. So it's interesting, of course, when you think about McCartney as a sort of example for me of, of all this, right, I mean, so McCartney um, was a governor, governor of Grenada in the West Indies, was the secretary to, uh, to the lieutenant governor, to the viceroy of Ireland. Um, uh, uh, he was the governor of Madras, right? Um, and then he becomes, and then he goes goes out to uh, goes out to China. But the opening to China, which he was trying to negotiate, he failed to negotiate, was part of this predatory empire model. He was politically very, very closely aligned. Uh, his initial uh, start in politics comes from George Grenville, who sort of initiated uh, these policies. He was in the circle around Robert Clive. Um, uh, so this model of empire, I mean, this idea was to try to get involved in China because they wanted to extract various goods from China. Silk, porcelain, um, uh, uh, and you know, uh, opium, obviously. Uh, but it was a sort of predatory, predatory model, and the idea was to try to figure out ways, ways of extraction. Um, and you know, there, were, uh, there was significant opposition uh, uh, for various reasons. And of course, I mean, uh, because of McCartney's position, he was associated with this. Um, now, uh, Southeast Asia, I know less about. Again, uh, partly because the East India Company, the East India Company, is very much involved, obviously, in a variety, a variety of ways. I mean, one um, one forgets, of course, those of us who think about uh, uh, modern history, that the East India Company's initial huge investment was in, in Indonesia, not not uh, in India, right? I mean, the whole goal was. I mean, uh, 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 but by by the period I'm talking about, um, the uh, the English East India Company doesn't have, a, I mean, doesn't have a significant, as much of it, uh, an influence as the Dutch do uh, uh, during during this period. So I don't know, but I just haven't worked that much on on what's going on in Indonesia or, or elsewhere. So I'm sorry, not. Uh, 
the uh, put a sort of a backwards history on this. So I think you know, like what we think is valuable now, and therefore put the history to make that valuable, isn't what people at the time thought was valuable. Like I understand, at the end of the Seven Years' War, they wanted the Sugar Islands back, and they prepared to give up Canada to get it. Now that seems mad now, but at the time that was where the wealth came from. So people's values. Yeah, yeah, no, without question, right? I mean, remember, I mean, Saint Domingue, what is now Haiti, was the wealthiest place in the world in 1770, right? Per capita, per capita income, at least for whites, uh, in Saint Domingue was higher than any place, any place in Europe, right? Um, uh, and you know, so writing, uh, you know, we would think it'd be, be odd about writing the writing the history of the world from the perspective of Haiti might seem uh, slightly odd to us. And of course, uh, uh, we we should also remember that you know, from the perspective of manufacturing, Bengal was the most advanced manufacturer, I mean, at least you know, according to Prasanam Partisarati, and I have no reason to doubt him. Uh, uh, you know, was was the most advanced manufacturer. I mean, it was remember in the over the course of the late 17th and 18th century, it was Britain importing calicos from. Bengal, not the other way around. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, I do think we tend to, I do think we tend to, I mean, I, again, I mean, I think the problem is because we write from the perspective of proto-national history, um, uh, you know, and, you know, those places that are wealthiest, most powerful, etc., tend to be the places that, gener you know, generate the most historians studying them now and therefore study their their prehistory, um, uh, you know, I think that that's a mistake. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, I mean, just, you know, to put, put it, uh, give you a sort of another example, right? The population of Ireland um, uh, uh, in uh, in 1783 was three million. The population of British North America was three million. Uh, the number of Irish historians uh, alive today versus the number of American historians, I think it's probably like fifty to one. Uh, 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 but in the uh, in the 18th century, that wouldn't have been an obvious choice to make. Um, at, at all. And again, I mean, you know, again, we don't have very many historians of, uh, and Jamaica, I mean, Jamaica was far wealthier than any North American colony in, in say, 1730 or 1740. There's no question about it. Uh, but, you know, again, the number of Jamaican historians, I can tell you, uh, you know, you can probably count on, you know, your hands and your feet. Uh, you know, uh, there's been a fair amount of, of, of um, discussion of this. I mean, some people, I mean, uh, you know, John Pocock, the uh, intellectual historian, can also be sort of seen as a, uh, uh, a defender of kind of New Zealand's place in, in the Commonwealth and a critique. I mean, his critiques of the EU can also be read as, uh, you know, a defense. Uh, I mean, the problem was is that Britain gave up on the EU, uh, <laughs> gave up on the empire in favor of the EU, and that was a big mistake. And after Brexit, uh, you know, he isn't triumphant about that. Uh, pri uh, uh, but nevertheless, uh, 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 you know, he sees, I mean, there's a sense in which he sees this as, as, as uh, kind of a, a, an inevitable mistake. But I don't think, uh, I mean, I don't think the institutions of the Commonwealth are anywhere near as strong as the institutions of, of the empire. And the fact of the matter is, is that we live in a world, uh, for better or worse, where, you know, uh, I mean, I think your lives are probably much more controlled by what goes on in the Australian, <laughs> in the, you know, in, in the government in Canberra than any, any decisions that's, ma that's made in Whitehall. Uh, I mean, I'm sure, you know, the decision to vote, to, uh, uh, to vote for Brexit is ha going to have global economic consequences, but it's not going to affect uh, Australia any more than places, uh, non-members, I mean, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, non-members of the Commonwealth. So I don't think, uh, uh, I mean, I think we still have vestiges of, you know, the institutions of the empire without question. I mean, I, you know, uh, uh, you know, I always sort of make the joke, the joke, if you go to, if you go to Ottawa and you see the changing of the guard, it sort of feels like a diminished Westminster in some sense. But I don't think most, most Canadians, um, uh, uh, most Canadians in any sense feel that, I mean, their lives are affected very much by, by decisions made in, uh, made in Westminster in any sort of way. So I don't think, I mean, I think, uh, I will say, um, and uh, this is, I mean, this is something that I think is extremely important. It's, uh, I mean, what I didn't talk about in this is what kind of visions of empire, what did the patriots, how did the patriots think an empire should be organized? Well, their notion of the way an empire should be organized was in terms of a confederation. 
right? That you shouldn't have centralized power just in Westminster, that you should have a confederation uh, with some sort of uh, neutral arbiter. Now, they never got what they wanted, but that was an argument that was seriously made in the 18th century, and obviously you see that revived um, uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and you can sort of see these notions of confederation, and they're not terribly different uh, from the arguments about what the EU should be, for example, today, with or without Britain. I mean, it's certainly sort of a confederation. So I do think these imperial ideas matter, but I don't think there's much, I mean, I don't think, um, uh, you know, other than culturally, I don't think that the, the, Brit the institutions of the British Empire matter that much. I mean, you know, the Commonwealth Games are very nice, uh, uh, but I don't think that they, they affect uh, governance in a sort of profound way. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And other discussions. I mean, to the extent that it is some kind of network of structure, it's a uh, hub and spoke structure rather than you know something that doesn't have some uh, metric. Sorry. Um, yeah. So why did you left that out? Because I mean, when I look at your definition of empire here, I can imagine. Um, you know, as I said, there's not an area but the Dutch East Indies, for example, might fit within your definition of empire. That is, it's a purely non ethnic and it has a right. Yeah, yeah. Kind of sometimes, so do I get called that name by the point? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, why is hierarchy left out? Well, so so part of the reason why I be, why why hierarchy is left out is precisely because I think the nature of hierarchy is what's frequently being contested politically. Um, so so um, <laughs> there's no question. I mean, the standard you know the box standard definition of empire by both the people I sort of see as you know this people nostalgic for empire and people who are morally outraged by empire is almost always one which assumes assumes a very rigid hierarchy. Um, but in fact, in the 18th century, the 17th and 18th centuries, precisely what was at stake, the debates were about what the nature of the political relationships were going to be. So Blackstone, who's always, I mean, if you look at anybody who writes about, uh, writes about the legal theory of empire in the 18th century, they always say, oh, well, Blackstone, he talks about, you know, uh, unified uh, the sovereignty of the imperial parliament. And that's what Blackstone said. Right? And he says that. There's no question he says about that. But what, what they fail to notice is that if you look in the 1760s and 1770s, in Ireland alone, there are 27 different pamphlets which are titled basically Blackstone is Wrong. Um, uh, that there's a huge, a huge debate about that. There's a huge, I mean, and uh, over and over again, the patriots say sovereignty in the modern world is complex. There cannot be unified sovereignty. And this is when they're moving in this direction about thinking about. Confederation, they argue that, look, what the real way the empire works is sovereignty is parceled out in a variety of ways. Um, certain things happen at the local level, the city level. Certain things happen at the street level. You know, uh, certain things happen at the provincial level. Certain things happen at the imperial level. And what constantly needs to happen is we constantly need to renegotiate them. And that's the patriot position. So for them, uh, the nature of hierarchy is always being negotiated. Uh, in a variety of ways. Whereas the establishment Whigs do see the sort of bog standard view that, that England is at the center, Westminster is at the center of what's going on in England, and everything sort of goes out from that. Now, admittedly, what I was trying to show in terms of the way the infrastructure comes out is that at times it looks like that was what's going on. Certainly that what looks like what's going on uh, in North America in the 1750s and 1760s with the building out of these road networks that do look like a hub and spoke model around you know the New York Albany line. But even then, they also I mean the the, the post office I mean the post office tries also to sort of parcel out. Uh, control to various uh, levels of the various spokes in, uh, uh, in different ways. Um, and so there's constantly this argument about confederation, right? So, so uh, and this argument about confederation happens over and over and over again uh, throughout the 18th century. When it begins with the Anglo-Scottish Union in 1707, right? So the, the Union is an incorporating union where Scotland becomes part of Britain and the Scots send representatives to the what becomes the Imperial Parliament, and they get less representation than the single English county of Cornwall, right? But there was an argument at the time by 
a number of people who were extremely, uh, extremely influential who said, no, we should have a confederal union instead of uh, an incorporating union. And that debate continues, right? I mean, that's the argument that the Scottish, uh, Scottish MPs make in Parliament in the 1730s and into, uh, into the 1740s and the Scottish Lords. Um, and the Irish, when they're proposed incorporating union in 1760s, they say, no, because we learned what happened to Scotland. We want a confederal union, which is exactly the argument that the North Americans make in the 1760s and 1770s, which is why the first American constitution is called the Articles of Confederation. Um, so the reason why, I mean, so that's a long answer to what I think is a very good question, because of the assumption that we always make is that not only is there hierarchy in the empire, but hierarchy is stable. And my po point of view is that what's at stake in a lot of these debates, from a constitutional point of view, is the nature of hierarchy and how you can diffuse one side trying to sort of diffuse power, one part trying to, to centralize power. Um, um, there's still going to be hierarchy even in the confederal model. It's just going to be a different kind of hierarchy, and that's what I want to be able to specify. I mean, I presume that the elites or the patriots come out on top. If someone uh, in the colonies decides to stop paying tax on, on, on tea, that they're both going to send gunboats. Well, no. So this is, this is the thing. In fact, I mean, the patriots opposed sending the gunboats, right? I mean, that was, so there was a big parliamentary debate about this. I mean, the uh, oh, Lord... So sorry, do you use some coercive language? Well, no. So what? I mean, so Pitt actually said. I mean, Pitt, who was the, then the leader of the Patriots, William Pitt the Elder, said, "No, we shouldn't do this at all. This was the wrong thing to do. What we should be trying to do is to come up with a new model, right? Uh, uh, which and where 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 this isn't going to happen. Where there is significant opposition at the locality, that we need to listen to them in a, a real way. Now, admittedly." Part of the argument, and this goes back to your earlier question about information, is part of the argument is that we made very, we, members of British Parliament, made very powerful policy because we had bad information about how people in the colonies were going to react to this. I mean, that's part of the argument, right? So the first thing you need to do is get better information. Um, but <coughs> they were absolutely opposed to any kind of coercive measure. And in fact, Interestingly, David Hartman, who's the guy who negotiates the Treaty of Paris in 1783, ending the Revolutionary War, said, we got what we wanted all along, right? Uh, we got an independent North America. We like that. Why? Because as long as they're guaranteed free trade, they're going to continue to purchase our manufactured goods, and now they're going to pay for their own defense. Um, and that, he said, was the true model of empire. I mean, this is amazing stuff that he's writing back and forth. So, so I mean, there's a whole variety of, of scales of ways in which one could sort of think about this. Just a little hypothetical question. How would Scotland react to Well, <laughs> I mean, so the fact of the matter is, is that nobody in the 18th century, I mean, nobody in the 18th century wanted the non-existence of the state. I mean, maybe, you know, a few, you know, uh, uh, arch Jacobites wanted what it, but they, I mean, if people in the 18th century wanted the state, nobody wanted free trade in the way that the way that we talk about free trade, because they all understood that you needed the state to uh, protect markets in a variety of ways. So people who talked about, you know, Adam Smith, for example, um, uh, who talked about, he thought about the importance of free ports, needed, knew that you needed to have gunboats to make sure that, I mean, because the Spanish government said, I mean, the Spanish Empire said you couldn't trade with it outside of the Spanish Empire at all. So if you're going to allow Spanish ships into a free port, say, in Jamaica or Dominica, where they established free ports. It meant that you had to provide naval protection to these Spanish traders coming into those ports. So they didn't think away. The state needed to be very powerful to allow for this, this, this kind of trade. Um, uh, so, I mean, my view is that, you know, Neil Ferguson, uh, Neil Ferguson and, and, and Jeremy Black, I mean, it's a fantasy, right? I mean, the British Empire, what... What distinguished the British, the British Empire from the French or the Spanish Empire was not the non-existence of the state. The state and its institutions were extremely powerful. What distinguished the various empires were the, the repertoires they chose to have. It was the politics that you need to understand 
uh, comparative politics to be able to understand the different outcomes, I think. So, uh, 